A mega merger is in the works, admits Vedanta after CNBC TV 18's report last night. Anil Agarwal's company will consider a reverse takeover of Kane India, Hindustan Zinc and Balco. The Vedanta stock rallies but Kane India plummets. More pressure on Tata Steel after employees in UK threaten to go on strike. The deal to sell its long products business may fall apart as the buyer raises concerns. That's an exclusive. Markets fall for the seventh straight day. Selling pressure continues on the last street, but bank stocks offer some respite as the Nifty defends the 8,000 mark. We're expecting another 50 to 75 basis points by uh, March 16. Depending upon the, how the economy pro progresses, uh, you can expect between 50 and 75 basis points. The RBI governor's hawkish commentary is not stopping HDFC banks. Aditya Puri and Morgan Stanley's Chetan Aya both expect more rate cuts in the days to come. We told you first and it's now official PVR Cinemas acquires DLF's DT Cinemas for 500 crore rupees. The company operates 29 screens in the National Capital Region and Chandigarh. After India, many countries including the US start to test Maggie samples. Singapore gives a clean chit. UK and Canada await results. Health Ministry officials brief the Prime Minister. The Delhi court sends State Law Minister Jitendra Singh Tomer to four days in police custody. Also pulls up the police for, and I quote, partial and hurried arrest. Ruling Aam Aadmi Party calls it political vendetta. Sahara may have found a savior in the Rubin brothers, but the clock is ticking. Subroto Roy needs to hunt for more funds before 23rd June deadline of the Supreme Court. And once bitten but not twice shy, sources say sports car maker Maserati plans to re-enter India, this time as an independent entity. That's a CNBC TV 18 exclusive. We must uh, ban the ban okay. in this country. Because this band is band that will not create a good culture. Spiritual guru Jaggi Vasudev speaks out against the culture of banning things in India. He also has an interesting solution to India's rural distress. An exclusive conversation coming up. We have been the lone... Uh, uh, prowlers in the Morgan Stanley conference venue. To what do you attribute this, uh, you know, uh, uh, mid-April onward selling that we are seeing in emerging markets to some extent as a whole, but uh, a little ac accentuated in India? We're actually overweight India within this overall bad environment in emerging markets. The world is in a difficult shape. Um, we have a very weak neighbor, which is China. And we think that that's one of the key drag on the global growth. I think the economy is picking up. So as we've already always said that our loan offtake is a function of the GDP. So as the GDP picks up, yes, there will be some increase. Well, the markets are under pressure. Monsoons care for growth, but Morgan Stanley's unperturbed sunsets at 30,000 by the end of the year and growth at 6.5% according to the old series. That's Morgan Stanley's big prediction for the year ahead. Good evening. Thanks very much for joining us on India Business Hour. Hi, Nathara. Good evening, Shireen. We've got mega market voices, mega corporate stories, and mega political battles. All I can say is we have a mega show lined up. Yes, we do. <laughs> and let's kick things off with today's trading action. It's been seven days in the red, and red is the only color on the last street, unfortunately. Market slipping yet again as the last hour played spoil spot. But the losses today at the end were minimal. The Nifty did manage to defend the 8,000 mark, but only just. The index is now a few points away from that level. The Sensex lost about 40 points. It tumbled below the the 26,500 level and there's been no respite for the mid caps either as the mid cap index lost nearly half a percent and there are, it looks more like there could be trouble in store and that's thanks to the MSCI index revision which we should hear about uh, later tonight or early in the morning. That's right Shireen, let's talk a little more about that. The MSCI has said this year China A shares are under review for inclusion to its emerging market index. China A shares are those that trade on Shanghai and the Shenzhen indices. 
If the China A shares are included in the MSCI Emerging Market Index, it's likely to hurt emerging markets like India in terms of index weight and capital flows. The Indian markets may see an outflow of a billion dollars from the exchange-traded funds. That's according to brokerages, something that has been reiterated by Kun Go of ANZ Research. Listen in. If MSCI do decide to include China in there, uh, then the first implication is that uh, fund managers all around the world will need to start adding China A shares as part of their portfolio. So that means we're going to see increased uh, equity inflows uh, into China uh, over time. I think the second implication is more interesting because if China were to be included in the benchmark indices, then naturally that means other uh, indices that are in there at the moment, their weightings will need to be reduced. Uh, therefore, that will uh, result in some selling uh, as fund managers undertake portfolio rebalancing. Well, that's uncertainty that's weighing on investor sentiment and we should hear from the MSCI perhaps at about 2.30 India time. So watch out for Power Breakfast on CNBC TV 18 as we take the action forward. But for a quick check of the currency market, fresh dollar selling by exporters and banks have helped the Indian rupee recover from its four-week low. The currency ended the day just above the 63.90 level to the dollar. Even as continued selling in the Indian equity market did cap the gains to 63.92 is where the rupee closed for the day. Now all hopes of higher growth continue on one big factor and that's the monsoon. First, let's give you the good news. The Met Department expects the monsoon to advance into the Konkan region, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu and Andhra Pradesh in the next two to three days. So that's the good news. And uh, Here's the bad news, and we do have some. The temperatures in daytime will not see any drop in central and northern parts of India, at least for a couple of days. The weatherman is also predicting heavy rainfall for the northeastern states of Assam and Meghalaya, and some thunderstorms over parts of Punjab, Haryana, Delhi, and Rajasthan, but no relief for parts of Bihar, UP, and Jharkhand, as the heat wave conditions will continue to prevail. So that's the latest there on the monsoon watch. Even though the Reserve Bank Governor, Raghuram Rajan, signaled a slightly higher inflation and perhaps no more rate cuts in his second June monetary policy statement. Eminent bankers and economists that we've been speaking to believe that the cost of loans could come down by between 75 to 100 basis points over the next 12 months. This is partly because they do expect at least one more rate cut from the Reserve Bank, but also because they see more room for banks to cut rates. Take a look. The RBI is not a cheerleader. Governor Rajan did not share the market when he announced a 25 basis points repo rate cut on June 2nd, but warned that he has little space for more cuts. As in the past policy, he hoped banks would pass on his cuts. His transmission plea seems to have touched a chord, and we saw a slew of bankers cutting lending rates by 25 to 30 basis points. Now big bankers say they see much larger cuts by the banks and maybe a little more from the central bank as well. One year down the line, depending upon the, how the economy pro progresses, uh, you can expect between 50 and 75 basis points. They should. I mean, let's, it just can't be the lenders. So let, uh, depositors as well. So let's say that we come to a more rational real rate of return. So if, 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 if uh, you have a rate of return, if you have inflation of say 5.5%, uh, one and a half percent on that is about seven percent should be what uh, uh, people should expect. Economists at Morgan Stanley believe that there's room for more than that. An additional rate cut as high as 75 basis points is expected before we close this financial year. Expecting another 50 to 75 basis points by uh, March 16. You have to look at the weighted average yields on loans and advances. That would probably be down by about uh, 75 to 100 basis points. And the other measure could be looking at commercial paper rate, which is already actually down quite significantly. That could also be down by another 75 to 100 basis points in another six to seven months' time. If banks do manage 100 basis points cut in rates, Governor Rajan's frugality may not be easy to bear. In Mumbai with Lata Venkatesh, this is Nana Svigilani. All right, so more room for rate cuts. That's the view coming in there from Aditya Puri and Morgan Stanley's Chetan Ayer. Now, the big story this evening, Anil Agarwal's dream of creating a natural resources conglomerate out of India is heading to a climax. In response to CNBC TV 18's story that Vedanta Resources is considering a mega merger with Kane India, the company has informed the stock exchanges that it's working on a reverse merger, not just with Kane India, but also Hindustan Zinc and Balco. CNBC TV 18, Sajid Mangat and Antara report on what's driving this latest round of restructuring at Agarwal's empire. It's all fragmented. 
you have a Hindustan zinc, you have a Balco, then you have a, a cane, and they thought if you put everything together, it makes sense for the shareholder, and they are working on it. For that is required Hindustan zinc shareholding to come from Indian government, is, is required cane approval. That's Vedanta Chairman Anil Agarwal in Davos in January this year, explaining the rationale behind a proposed consolidation exercise at the group level. Cut to six months later, the buzz on the street is getting louder. Both Vedanta and Kane India were in focus a day after CNBC TV18 reported the boards of the two companies are likely to meet this weekend to mull a possible merger. This prompted Vedanta to issue a press release in which it clarifies that it is mulling a reverse merger, not only with Kane India, but also with HZL and Balco. Vedanta Resources says, and I quote, should a transaction with Kane India proceed, it could potentially be considered a reverse takeover. In addition, in line with the group's stated strategy to continue to simplify the group structure, the group continues to evaluate a transaction with the government of India in relation to their minority stakes in Hindustan Zinc Limited and Bharat Aluminium Company, unquote. Agarwal has been wanting to stitch this merger together to create a natural resource conglomerate out of India and one comparable to BHP Billiton and Rio Tinto. Here's why a reverse merger with Kane India may not be a bad idea. It will still give Vedanta access to Kane's cash pile, which it last reported at 17,000 crore rupees. A possible reverse merger also does not require Vedanta and Kane to follow the cumbersome process of changing all of Kane India's mining leases with the Indian government. It also means that it won't have to worry that much about Kane Energy's 10% plus stake in Kane India. Kane Energy has been served with a $1.4 billion tax demand notice and instructed not to sell its stake in Kane India. As for HZL and Balco, we have to wait to see if the Metal Corporation Act permits a reverse merger or if the government as a minority shareholder has the rights to play spoiler. The government's residual stake in HZL is 29.5% and 49% in Balco. And so far, the government has made no progress in selling or auctioning its holding in these two companies. There are other compelling reasons for the consolidation. Vedanta's debt stands at a massive 77,000 crore rupees without subsidiaries and 32,000 crore rupees with subsidiaries. Now imagine how its prospects could change if it were to tap into the 17,000 crore rupee cash of Kane India and 30,000 crore rupees of HZL. All eyes now on Vedanta informing the stock exchanges of the board meeting to discuss the consolidation. With Sajit Mangat in Mumbai, Nantara Rai in New Delhi. And more action expected this weekend when the boards of Kane India and Vedanta meet. What for Vedanta to Tata Steel, the company's UK operations are on the verge of being hit very badly. That's after Tata Steel management talks with the workers' union of the UK plant failed to end the deadlock. Now the unions have decided to go on a strike beginning the 22nd of June. CNBC TV 18 Sanjay Suri caught up with Roy Rickas, the general secretary of the community trade union. Here's their conversation. It's very, very uh, sad that we've reached this position because people need to understand that the unions in the UK are not uh, militant trade unions that work in the steel industry. We believe in working in partnership, in good relationship with the company, and for over 35 years, through the days of British Steel, Chorus, and now Tata, we've had excellent relationships, and by negotiating and talking to each other sensibly, we've been able to deal with many, many, many issues uh, and we've managed to find solutions to lots of challenges. What was this situation to which you couldn't find a solution? Well, in, in, in a nutshell, what had happened, we began discussions with the company back in November about the future of the British Steel pension scheme. And we were prepared to make significant uh, concessions and we were prepared, prepared to recognize the challenges that the company uh, have and to look at the benefits and the way the scheme is funded. Unfortunately, uh, the company were hell-bent on confrontation from day one. I've never known uh, a situation where the company were not prepared to negotiate meaningfully with the trade unions. Well, that's the view coming in there from the labor unions. But that's not all. After the UK labor union strike announcement, sources say that the sale of the company's long products business to the Klesh Group may be threatened. Now, this was crucial to bringing down the debt of Tata Steel and strengthening its European operations. Kritika, who's been tracking that story, joins us now with the exclusive details. Kritika, some more trouble for Tata Steel. 
Well, Tata Steel has been looking at selling its long products business uh, since the last one to one and a half years. The reason for that is, uh, as you said, they are looking at bringing down their 70,000 crore rupee debt. But more importantly, the long products business has been an overhang for the European operations. Once they sell, it, sell that out, not only will they be able to bring in cash flows into the company, they will also ensure that they uh, they uh, optimize and maximize their EBITDA per ton specifically. Now, uh, they had finally gotten a buyer that is the Klesh Group. They were in due diligence talks with them. This is official information that Tata Steel had given. However, our sources say that the Clash Group is wary of the likely strike that will go through. June 22nd, as we have been reporting, is the date that the unions have confirmed to go on strike. Clash uh, Group has made it very clear that if Tata Steel were to go for a strike, uh, more importantly an indefinite strike, uh, that they would be unwilling to go through with the deal and that will significantly affect the valuations of the company. Meanwhile, Tata Steel, of course, is working on uh, reaching a mid-ground with with the UK uh, labor unions and uh, changing their uh, proposed pension plan. We understand, however, that they're looking or they rather need cost savings of around 800 million pounds in the revised pension plan, which is what they're working towards. Uh, many conversations have fallen through. So let's see if this one goes ahead or not. Well, thanks, Akitika, for joining us with all of those exclusive details. Data Steel, though, up in trade today by about a tenth of a percent. More corporate news is coming from Deal Street. You heard it first right and CNBC TV 8 on the 20th of May. Now it's confirmed. PBR Cinemas has announced it's going to be acquiring DLF's DT Cinemas for 500 crore rupees. Ajay Bijli of PBR says this will be funded mostly via equity. He added all DT Cinemas will be rebranded as PVR and that PVR will have the right of first refusal to open multiplexes in all of DLF's upcoming malls. If you look at the macro picture, India has hardly got any new multiplex screens and overall it's, it's uh, 1800 uh, screens only uh, overall uh, in the country mm. and you know about 7,000 uh, 7, single screens. So I think uh, uh, we are still I find pretty uh, insignificant in terms of uh, what the potential of the whole country is. Uh, so we're not looking at that. We're all about getting right locations. The DT cinemas will be rebranded as PVR cinemas and, and all the future malls which are coming up of uh, DLF also, uh, PVR will house uh, our multiplexes in that. Well, that's Ajay Pichli of PBR talking about the acquisition of DT Cinemas. It's a 500 crore rupee deal. It's the second time, lucky, they walked out in 2010, if my memory serves me right, and managed to stitch it up uh, in 2015. Now, after Indian regulators raised an alarm, international regulators have begun testing Nestle's Maggie noodles. We learn that the Singapore food regulator has given Maggie a clean chit, even as results are awaited from Canada and UK. We also learn that six states in the United States have begun testing samples of Maggie noodles. Nestle is also in the process of conducting an internal investigation. Priya joins us now with the details. Priya, the good news is that Singapore's food regulator has given the clean chit to Maggie, uh, but other test results are still awaited. Well, after the Singapore food regulator gave a clean chit to Maggie noodles, other foreign food regulators, including those from US, UK and Canada, have started testing samples of Maggie noodles. So, to say that a total of six states in the US, including Delaware, North Carolina, New York, Wisconsin, Colorado and California, have started tests on Maggie samples. Meanwhile, we learned that Nestle has not only opened up doors to the FSSAI to conduct checks at its plants, but is also working on an internal investigation plan. The group is working on two key priorities, first to check the root cause of the problem if any and second to iron out issues with the government. The internal investigation will be across all of its five noodle manufacturing facilities. The testing of samples is taking place at nine internal and two external labs. The internal investigation we learn is a precautionary measure to ensure safety standards. Meanwhile, Nestle says it has already contested Uttarakhand government's ban on its Pantanagar plant at Uttarakhand High Court. So so yes, the Maggi soup just continues to get thicker. Back to you. Now, thanks, Apriya, for joining us with all of those details. So several regulators globally beginning test Singapore, meanwhile giving it a clean chit. Back home in India, the Prime Minister also held a meeting with Health Ministry officials to review the Maggi situation. The Union Health Secretary, who led the team, is said to have appraised Modi on the current situation in the country. Not just that, Nestle has also come under fire from traders. The Confederation of All India Traders has urged the Union Health Minister to issue instructions to Nestle for immediate repayment. Nestle had recalled all of its Maggi stock.
on Friday. In fact, we are just getting information uh, from our colleague Priya Seth and she's been in touch with the UK regulator and the UK regulator informing CNBC TV 18 saying that currently the testing process is on. Uh, Nestle has informed us that the only variety of Maggi noodles they import into the UK from India is the masala flavor. The FSA is now testing this flavor and other flavors as a precaution. Tests are currently undergoing and these results are not available at this time. They have requested the information on the test results and batches involved from Indian authorities by the European Commission's channel. So that is the first word coming in from the UK regulator to CNBC TV 18. Moving on, Indigo Airlines already controls more than a third of the domestic market, but according to global aviation consultancy CARPA, it could grab up to 50% share in just two more years. In its report titled Indian Aviation Outlook, CARPA has estimated that Indigo will grab 40% of the domestic aviation market this fiscal itself, and this bodes well for the airline, which is expected to go public very soon. Sindhu Bharacharya finds out why Indigo is successful when most competitors are struggling. India's domestic aviation market grew in F515 on the back of low fuel prices and increasing demand for air travel. Since fuel prices account for anywhere between 40 to 45 percent of an airline's costs, the downward spiral was good news for all airlines in India. Indigo, which is already the largest in terms of passengers with over 36 percent share of the market, has reaped the maximum benefits from this fuel price decline bonanza. A large part of Indigo's success comes from its ability to outmaneuver competition by introducing excess capacity in the market. The airline started in 2005-06 by placing a huge order for 100 Airbus 320 aircraft. An Indigo spokesperson confirmed to us today that all the 100 aircraft have been delivered to the, to the airline by now. Compare this with competition. SpiceJet, for example, has just 20 operational Boeing aircraft and a fleet of another 15 smaller Q400s. The only other LCC in the market, which is GoAir, has a fleet of only 19 aircraft. In 2011, Indigo surprised everyone when it placed a second order with Airbus for 180 A320neos and deliveries of the first aircraft from this order will begin in November this year. The airline has gone ahead and placed one of the largest aircraft orders for 250 more of the A320neos last year. As of now, Indigo has a fleet of 96 operational aircraft and offers over 600 daily flights connecting 38 destinations. It's widely expected to go for a public offer soon and could raise up to $400 million by offloading up to 25% equity. The CAPA report has pointed out that the frantic pace of growth at Indigo has also been profitable. According to CAPA's estimates, there was strong revenue growth for Indigo in FY 2015 and its revenues crossed the $2.5 billion mark. At this rate, Indigo's top line will be within striking distance of jets by the end of FY 2016. CAPA says Indigo is estimated to have posted a record profit of $150 to $175 million in FY15, representing a net margin of 6 to 7%. An Indigo spokesperson declined to comment on the CARPA report. In New Delhi, with Sindhu Bharacharya, this is Shireen Bhan. Insight over there on why Indigo is profitable. Moving on, lenders have given a big thumbs up to RBI's move to empower them against defaulting borrowers by making it easier for them to acquire a control of the company. While the new rules will help fix the skewed system of weak lenders and all powerful ba borrowers, bankers say some constraints still remain. CNBC TV 18 is with the same with that report. India's crony capitalists beware. In what could be one of the boldest moves made by Raghuram Rajan against errant promoters yet, the Reserve Bank of India allowed banks to take majority control in a company if a borrower fails to meet restructuring milestones. I can visualize banks like us looking at three, four clients who have had challenges for the last year or so being uh, sort of, this is a good discussion route with them. At the heart of it, it has to be a, a well-designed and wanting to make an improvement kind of situation. If it's a wrong intent, this won't work. Experts feel that it will now be a disincentive for stress promoters to stall negotiations on asset divestment for the fear of losing control over the company. Lenders like State Bank of India, ICICI Bank and Axis Bank will be the biggest beneficiaries as they have huge exposure to large infra projects. Banks can also use this new power as a leverage to negotiate faster settlements and asset transfers. Hopefully it will deter the promoters uh, from not uh, following the restructuring norms which have been laid down uh, as a part of the restructuring exercise. 
So I think it should be a big positive. Obviously, we need to wait and see uh, the execution of this. So obviously, the proof is in the pudding. While this will give banks a big leg up, the rules are not a magic bullet. Getting the shareholders' approval for banks to take majority control may not be a smooth process. No will be identifying a new promoter who will be willing to take over the company. But given that India has no bankruptcy laws, RBI's latest move will not only give banks more teeth to bite, but also put an end to powerful promoters using their influence to restructure loans without the intention of paying back for good. In Mumbai, Ritu Singh. Well, the new NPA rules no magic bullet, but uh, could be a significant deterrent. Now, the big national headlines, a big setback for the Aam Aadmi Party, Delhi Law Minister Jitendra Singh Tomar, will spend the next four days in jail. This after the Saket court granted the police custody in the fake degree case. The court, however, pulled up the Delhi police for the arrest, calling the manner of Tomar's arrest partial and hurried. Uh, since he had been issued a notice less than 24 hours before his arrest, the Aam Aadmi Party has launched an all-out attack on the central government and the Lieutenant Governor of Delhi, Najib Jung, who is said to have granted the permission to the state police to go ahead and arrest Tomer. The tussle between the state government and the Lieutenant Governor has been going on for some time now, with the AAP government accusing him of continuously undermining its authority and acting at the behest of the central government. The Congress party, which held a meeting of all nine chief ministers of Congress rule states today, has hit out at the center, accusing it of discriminating against these Congress rule states. Congress President Sonia Gandhi criticized the Modi government for slashing financial programs to states which are ruled by her party's chief minister. Congress Vice President Rahul Gandhi hit out hard at Prime Minister Modi. He said that the roar of the Make in India line is not audible to the masses. Financial allocation for these programs has been slashed, like women and child development, uh, I mean, health, education, across the board, all uh, the important yojanas of the UPA. Again, naturally causing uh, problems for our states. CMs ne kaha ki Modi sarkar kehti hai ki सीएम्स को पैसा दे रही है मगर एक हाथ से देती है पैसा दूसरे हाथ से लेती है तो ये बात उठी दूसरी बात उठी कि जो हमारे किसान हैं गरीब लोग हैं उनको सरकार बिल्कुल भूल गई है मेक इन इंडिया के बारे में बोला कि भाई बहुत अच्छा लोगो है बहुत बड़ा शेर है मगर शेर की आवाज सुनाई नहीं दे रही है well, refuting the allegations of discrimination leveled by the Congress parties you just heard there from Rahul Gandhi and Sonia Gandhi, Finance Minister Arun Jaitley has posted a rebuttal on his Facebook page. Jaitley claimed that contrary to the opposition's claim, central grants have been issued to nine Congress ruled states and they're rebutting what the Congress is alleging. Meanwhile, former Prime Minister Manmohan Singh, who was also present at the meeting, also took on the government, raising doubts about the validity of the new GDP numbers. A noted economist, Manmohan Singh, said, and I quote, that doubts have been expressed by both people within and outside the government about the validity of the new GDP numbers which are being computed under the new formula. He also expressed his reservations on the government's dealing with autonomous institutions like the RBI, saying that he hopes the government respects the autonomy of these institutions that have stood the test of time. Time. This is important news now. The Indian Army has launched a counter-offensive operation on last week's ambush in Manipur in which 18 soldiers were killed in the Chandel district. The Army is carrying out operations along the Indo-Myanmar border against insurgent groups. The Army says its operations have resulted in significant casualties on the militants who were involved in last week's ambush. The Army also says it had intelligence of the militants planning to carry out more such attacks on Indian soil. In fact, Rajivardhan Singh Rathor uh, has reacted saying that uh, the Indian government will not tolerate any attacks, uh, whether from Indian soil or from foreign soil, and the Indian army has carried out what he sees is a historic operation. Sadhguru Jaggi Vasudev is a philanthropist, a yogi, a mystic. So what is he doing at a Morgan Stanley investor conference? It's a slightly confusing combination. CNBC TV 80's Lata Venkatesh caught up with him on the sidelines of that conference to find out what he makes of this government, the culture of banning things in India and the current agrarian crisis. Here's an excerpt of that conversation. Swachh Bharat, this yoga day, these are not separate things. This is a continuum. I am really, really glad a national leader is thinking about these things and wanting this to happen because we have not seen that 
in a few centuries, any leader talking about how you should be within yourself. Certain nations have done this, but we have not done this in this country, and it's time to do it. If we want to really progress, if we want to be a success in the business, individual human beings must be organized. Let me come to another theme, which is a recurrent one uh, in the economy, farm distress. I mean, uh, two y successive years of bad uh, monsoon and one unseasonal rain has only compounded the problem. Uh, what would you advise uh, uh, the government? In next 10 to 15 years, yeah. if we do not reduce the number of people involved in farming, you will only drive them to suicide or even worse, okay? Other things will happen. In the United States, only 2% is involved in farming, but there the land is different, the mechanization is different, our land and our crops are of a different nature. Let's allow up to 20%. So what do we do with the remaining 50% of the population, move them to Mumbai, it will be a disaster. We have to urbanize rural India. We are, we are always thinking of huge cities, smart cities now. We need to urbanize rural India. Things that are available in a city should become available in the village. Final point, which seems to be creating a lot of dissonance uh, in recent days, the government's call for a beef ban. As a yogi and a spiritual leader, what's your uh, reaction? My thing is, first of all, we must uh, ban the ban okay. in this country. Because this ban this, ban that will not create a good culture. If we don't want something, there are other ways to do it. We should educate people. We must see what are the sensitivities of the nation and address it in a different way. Just ban this, ban that is not an answer. Anything that you be ban unnecessarily becomes popular. Well, ban the ban, that's the word coming in from Sadhguru Jaggi Vasudev. But on that note, it's time for us to wrap up this edition of India Business Hour. Uh, of course, we are awaiting details and information on the MSCI recast, whether the China A shares will be included or not. Uh, that's a big worry that investors are grappling with, but that announcement is expected much, much later tonight. So catch a special edition of Power Breakfast as we take the action forward. From all of us here, for tonight, good night. Thanks for watching.